Okay, welcome to the Open Textbook Network's Pub 101 meeting four. It was great to see many of you at Open Ed in Phoenix last week. And for those of you who are not there, hope that you had a good week. I'm gonna spend a few minutes orienting us um, to where we left off and then with any luck, hand things over to Corinne. She has not arrived in the call yet, but I know she um, knows to be here. So uh, we're gonna keep the show on the road. The show must go on. I'm mixing my metaphors already. Anyway, picking up where we left off, uh, two weeks ago we talked about calls for proposal with Karen Bjork, and before that we talked about MOUs with Carla Myers. And in this last week, your homework was to watch the video on implementing a publishing program, because that's really what we're in the thick of here is the implementation. And today we're gonna continue in that related theme about project management. Uh, specifically, we're gonna focus on project management a little bit more during the writing and production phases. Now, before we dig into that, as a reminder, I know it can be really overwhelming when talking about um, publishing programs and all of the possible things that a publishing program may include. And so this is a friendly reminder that really um, it's up to you to select what you can do based on your capacity. And that of course is going to inform your project management list of things to do. Um, there are lots of different ways to support authors and lots of different ways to publish a book. And so while we're touching on a lot of different moving parts and options, please um, remember that uh, it's about what's doable and it is possible to leave things on the table for next time or for never. So, um, so far we've talked a lot about front loading work. Um, for example, we talked about considering accessibility from the beginning. We've talked about call for proposals and MIU, MOUs as communication tools that communicate the way you've designed your publishing program. <clears throat> Excuse me, and now we're gonna focus on when authors are writing and turning in their manuscripts. So last week I said a few things about production timelines and the importance of including your workflow into production timeline calculations. In other words, if you're giving authors a year to write, you wanna be sure to give yourselves a few months to work on the manuscript once it is finished. One of the things you might be during, doing during that time is vetting the manuscript. And I just wanna introduce this key term, vetting or to vet a manuscript. You'll see it in unit four. Um, and basically it just means looking over the manuscript to see what you've got. Um, and you're probably gonna have a checklist for vetting. And vet is the word that um, one of our publishing partners uses, and that's scribe. And so you'll see that in the curriculum. Um, and you'll see their very extensive vetting lists. And you are not meant to sort of internalize these lists in any way. It really shows you, though, um, what they look at as a professional publishing service operation. And you can sort of pick and choose from there. Um, what you may want to vet in a manuscript, if anything at all. So I just kind of wanted to introduce the term vetting and also um, just sort of raise a flag and say, hey, by no means are you supposed to sort of um, get, get all this vetting stuff into your head. It's just meant to show you here are some things to consider if you can, if you have the capacity cons to consider those. Um, so uh, as a final note on vetting, um, if you join the co-op, you can always ask a scribe to vet the manuscripts for you. If indeed you look at these lists and think, gosh, it would be great to have this done, but I'm not in a place to do it, but we have some funds to do it. Um, that is certainly the, something you can pay them to do. Um, I'm also going to share a uh, production checklist that you can use as part of your vetting tool during this call. Um, Corinne may talk about it a bit as we move on in the hour. The second term I want to introduce uh, this morning are style guides. Now, most of you, if not all of you, are probably already familiar with style guides. And I just want to point out here that they can really simplify your life and the relationship with the author as you prepare to publish. And I would suggest, if at all possible, to consider determining the style guide at the outset rather than after the manuscript has been written, 
if you're if you're trying to edit or proofread and you need some sort of style guide of course it's much easier if the author has been working with that style guide from the beginning as well so this may be determined by the discipline that they're in um, it may be determined by you know the popular style guides that are out there or your publishing program you could decide we always want to use chicago manual of style or we always want to use ap style um, that's something you can sort out um, in your publishing program. And of course, while it's great to have style, um, the bigger picture here is really about consistency and the style guide is a tool for consistency. Um, I have a, 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 an example close to home. Uh, some of the feedback I received on one of the units in the, in the publishing curriculum noted that I had switched from AP to Oxford comma styles. I was inconsistent and the reader, the learner noticed that and it distracted that person and mea culpa, commas are definitely uh, something that I flip flop on. So um, I, I raised that point just to say, you know, it is something that readers may notice and so having consistency in a textbook can really help the learner focus on the content that you want them to come away with. Okay, I'm gonna check in and see, um, Hi, Karen. Oh, yes. It's Mark here. Corin, Corin's here in the chat. Um, she doesn't have her video or microphone on, but I can see. I'm here. Oh, great. Hi, Corinne. Hi. <laughs> you kept things exciting. Oh, sorry. I, I know I was uh, in another meeting, so just Excellent. Yeah. Um, do you have your slides? I'm about ready to hand things over to you. Good. I'm ready. Okay. Uh, let me give you a proper introduction. Um, oh, and I will not forget to do polls like I forgot, sadly, in our previous meeting. So before I hand things over to Corinne and as she gets her slides ready, um, I do have two polls for you that I'm going to launch now. With any luck, you should be seeing a poll that asks you, for those of you planning to launch an open textbook publishing program, at which stage do you most closely identify? You're just getting started, so you have funding. It's on the calendar. You know you're gonna do a call for proposals. Perhaps you're live, you've done a call for proposals, or it's happening, you've selected projects to support, or you may even be in the thick of it, actively supporting projects. Please let us know where you're at if you're planning on launching a publishing program. Okay, I'm gonna end this poll and do the second one. First, I'm gonna share results. With any luck, you guys can see these results. The majority of you are just getting started. You may have funding. And then many of you, a close second, are in the thick of it, actively supporting projects. So as Corinne is talking through her slides and her experiences, please feel free to chime in with your own experiences and add to the conversation. And then finally, I'm going to do poll two. This poll was inspired by, I think it was Ray, your question two weeks ago. You asked what kind of project management tools people may be using. And so we thought we would ask all of you, if you have a project management tool that you like and would recommend, here are some common ones. There's Trello, Basecamp, Asana, Jira, maybe something else uh, that we hope you'll tell us about. When Corinne and I were working on this poll, I said, Corinne, should, should we add like Google Spreadsheets or something a little more homegrown? And she pointed out, while a spreadsheet can be a great way to work if you have one project, it's probably not going to sustain you if you have several projects going at once. Mm -hmm. uh, more on that shortly. So a lot of Trello users. Fun fact, I use Trello with a student assistant on uh, Open Textbook Library Edition, so I'm familiar with that one. Basecamp coming in in a second, Other. Okay, so for those of you who use Other, I would love to know in the chat what your tools are. Perhaps we should all take a look at them. So this is what this is how we're uh, getting the job done out there. Thank you for, for chiming in. Now I'm sharing. There's a lot of buttons involved with the polls, so I thought I was sharing before, but apparently not. Airtable, hmm. 
any of those options free? Trello is free. I think a lot of them have like some free version that then yeah. you pay for an add-on afterwards. Yeah. So Amanda, I hear you on spreadsheets as well. And maybe you found a way to use them for multiple projects, in which case we'd love to hear about it. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks everybody for your participation. I am now happy to introduce Corinne Guimont. She's the digital publishing specialist at Virginia Tech Libraries. And she is going to talk about what she's learned about project management, working with authors and her various roles um, in the world of textbook publishing. So thanks for being here, Corinne. I'm turning things over to you. Great. So I'm sharing my screen right now so you can all see my slides. Um, yes, so as Karen said, I'm a, I work in our publishing unit at Virginia Tech. Um, actually just got a job change, so I'm now a digital scholarship coordinator. I do a lot of work with um, open educational resources as well as a lot of work with digital humanities projects. Um, I did have a brief stint as a contract employee at Cengage as a content digitization project manager, which sounds really fancy, but basically I, um, worked on doing the production process for the eBooks and kind of following that piece. So I have a, some background with textbooks, I guess. <laughs> um, so it's working with authors. I think it's always best to start with um, what, what do you want to do first? I think defining your expectations. I know you all have talked a lot about the CFP and the MOUs at this point. It's always good to revisit those and revisit them again and again and again, um, being really clear on what the expectations are for you, for the author, for any other parties that might be involved. And then finding the best mode, mode of communication, um, email, phone, in person, a messenger app. I know somebody in the comments just mentioned Slack. That's a great thing to do. A project management tool um, at Cengage, we used Jira a lot and assigned tickets back and forth, and that was kind of how we communicated to each other. Um, and if you're doing something in person, make sure you're setting those times to check in regularly. There is a link to this author intake document in the slides um, that kind of has a lot of things that maybe you should consider early on as well. And then since we've talked about project management tools a lot, um, I wanted to add that there's really no right tool. I think a lot of the tools, especially Jira, Asana, Basecamp, they're good tools. That's why they're so well known. A lot of it really depends on what is what works for you and your team. Um, so things to consider, are you all at the same institution? Does your institution provide access to one of these tools that would be easy for you, for you to use? Um, some I know here at Virginia Tech, uh, there's a lot of people using Trello as well. So that's something that we've looked at um, because it's already, it's already been approved. It's already gone through all those processes. It makes it a lot easier. Um, is there a tool you're already using? I have accounts with Basecamp, with Trello, with Google Sheets, all those things. So whenever somebody says, what project management tool can we use for this project? I go, can we use one of the ones I already have so I don't have to log into another thing? And I know it's the same with researchers and authors that I work with. They don't want to have to check on one more thing as they're doing as they're going through this work. So something that's already in use is always very helpful. Um, and then similar to the institution, do you all have access to any specific tools? Is there something that uh, like Trello, everybody is using Trello already, making sure that everybody has access to that. If it is a paid service, and if you have somebody outside of your team who can't access that paid service, that could present a very, -ish, uh, very tough situation. Um, and this is kind of the biggest one. Does everybody know how to use it? Um, <laughs> When I was at Cengage, Jira was just introduced and it was very difficult to get people to use the tool and to follow the process. And it became an issue uh, as we were working along because some people start doing email and then I wasn't sure where to check with things. Um, any tool is great, but if nobody knows how to properly use it, it's not going to do any good. And that's unfortunately just the reality of it. So making sure everybody knows how to use it. And if they don't already know how to use it, are they willing to learn? Are they willing to follow through with any workflows you have set? And then after kind of doing all this, there's other key things to discuss with your authors early on. Um, these should have been established, hopefully established in your CFP and MOU, but it's again, always good to revisit. 
and having more detailed conversations at this point. You've already agreed to move forward on the project, so you want to make sure that you have set goals and your clear, um, clear ex expectations. So what's the end result of this look like? Is it an online textbook? Is it a print textbook? Is it both? Are you doing something? Um, are you gonna have like a Pressbooks online version and then a print on demand version through Amazon or through Lulu or something like that? Sorry, something like that. Um, who's the audience? Is this directed towards students? Is this directed towards like a community learning environment? Who, who's using it? And that can kind of dictate also how, how are you sharing it online? Making sure that people have access, access to those uh, systems that you're sharing it through. How does it fit with other works? Other works that the author has created as well as that your publishing program has created. Um, you wanna make sure that this is, if you're developing a program, you wanna make sure this really fits in terms of the work that your program is promoting. Um, if you've done a whole bunch of engineering textbooks and this is your first art history textbook, is that the direction that you all want to go in? And then also what's the past experience, specifically for the author, because that can kind of lay out what their expectations are gonna be. Have they written a textbook with a commercial company before? Are they expecting the same process? Um, have they done a monograph? Have they done an open textbook before, an open monograph that might make them understand a little bit more uh, the type of work that they're dealing with? Um, sometimes you'll have people who have been like editors on journals and that can be really helpful in making sure that they know what the publishing process does look like to some extent. Rights and licensing is always a big one. Sometimes people think they have a really good grasp on Creative Commons and then you'll talk to them and they've started choosing images that are not Creative Commons licenses. <laughs> so making sure that that is a very clear thing that you've talked about that and that they understand maybe that they have resources available, that they know where to go look for images or for content, especially as they get into adapting more and more content for their textbook. Um, also something to consider is how does this fit into your author's professional development? Um, does their program, are they pre-tenure, are they going through that process and does, does this project fit with that process? It's kind of a sticky situation to have because you really do want to publish this work. Um, but sometimes that can lead into a time commitment question, which is the next point of if they've, if they're putting all their work into this, but they need to actually be writing a monograph for their tenure, are they going to be suddenly putting more pressure on you? Believe me, that's happened <laughs> where I've had, um, I've been working on a project and somebody's going, I need more help from you. I can't get this done because I need to write my monograph for, for tenure. And I'm going, I, I don't have time to do your project for you and I'm not a history expert. So um, I think that's something to really be open about to make sure that you're in the same place as you move forward. And then also how does that affect the schedule if that affects the schedule or are there other schedule items? Are they planning on using this book in the spring and are they coming to you in November expecting that they can publish a book in two months? Probably not. Um, <laughs> making sure that the schedule that they want or need it by is doable. Um, and then based on your capacity and your program desi design, you might want to also discuss some structural things with your textbook. What is the structure of it? Are they following parts, chapters, sections? Um, are they hoping to have different chapters like identified, not necessarily chapter one, two, three, but maybe they want chapter A, B, C. Who knows? People want the weirdest things sometimes, but making sure that that's clear. Um, what style are they used? As Karen mentioned, the style sheets. Uh, um, are they looking to use AP, but everything else in your program has been following Chicago style? Making sure that that conversation is happening early on is really helpful, especially as they get into the writing process. And then this seems weird, but any special or tricky items, the more that you know that might cause issues as you're in that production or layout and design phase, the more you know about that early on, the easier it is to schedule. Tables are a huge pain in the butt. They're a pain in the butt for accessibility tagging. They can be difficult to do with layout. I, I mean, they look great. They're really great for visual learners, um, but in terms of doing uh, accessibility tagging for tables, it's a lot more work. Um, so being aware of how many tables are, there are, if there's gonna be a lot of tables. Um, math is a big one. We are Virginia Tech. We have published a couple of engineering textbooks. And we have a couple more on the way. Math is tricky. Uh, equations don't always 
cooperate nicely. So making sure that you're aware if there's a ton of equations in there. Um, something to know if you're planning on using Pressbooks, you can use a LaTeX plugin with Pressbooks. Um, so making sure that you have those equations available on LaTeX or if you have somebody who knows LaTeX. Um, I don't, I'm not an expert in LaTeX. I can kind of fumble my way through it, but if I have a book coming my way that isn't, that does have those LaTeX equations in it and I need to know how many there are. So sometimes we'll hire somebody to do the LaTeX for us. If there's only one or two, I can fumble my way through one or two. Um, so something, those are things to know, know about early on. Um, what's their writing method? Are they writing in Microsoft Word? Are they writing in a text file? Are they writing completely in LaTeX? We have a book that was published completely out of LaTeX. Um, that's something to help early on. It helps you figure out what later steps you're going to need. Um, our book that's published in LaTeX, the, the um, layout and design is, is produced from that LaTeX file itself. It makes it really easy for us, but that's, that's good for us to know early on that we don't have to stress out about that layout design phase. Sometimes if they can provide some sort of outline or sample chapter, something you can vet if we're using these new terms, um, that's really helpful as well so that you are prepared, you know what's coming your way when you start getting that manuscript. I already kind of covered attribution and copyright, but it is a huge issue when working with open textbooks, so it's something that you can never discuss too much. Um, and then accessibility, um, I know you all have talked about that a bit in creating alt text, but also making sure you're clear in terms of who in that process is creating the alt text. Like I said, I've worked on engineering textbooks. I am not an engineering expert. I cannot write alt text for those figures if my life depended on it. Um, so making sure that if the author is, doesn't have the time to write the alt text themselves, is there a student that you can hire? Um, if you're, so we provide grant funding uh, to our authors here. And what we'll do is work with them to hire a student using that grant funding to then maybe create some of the alt text for us. And then making sure that that's shared in a way that we can add it to the files as, as we get it. Now the actual working with authors, we've, I just went over a whole bunch of things that you should discuss with them early on. How are you laying out your expectations? All of that stuff. The actual part is, um, it, seems, it seems easier said than done, but just follow up with what you said you were gonna do. Um, sometimes if you're, say you're communicating all through your project management system, if you're, looking at JIRA specifically, and everybody's gonna put their comments in the ticket there, and that's what you've agreed to do, don't go and send an email. <laughs> make sure that that is all in one place, if that's what you said you were gonna do, and make sure that you're kind of following up on that. Check in regularly. If you set times to check in in person, make sure that you're meeting at those times. Um, that is key. I know Karen Bjork a couple weeks ago mentioned that a couple of her authors, um, she said if she had checked in with them earlier, she would have been able to kind of resolve or help them with some issues that they were dealing with. So it's, it's really key. Sometimes it might be a quick five, 10 minute conversation. Just say, hey, is, how's your writing going? Oh, it's great. Okay, good. And move on. Um, but sometimes they might be saying, hey, I'm actually really struggling with finding images on this topic that are Creative Commons licensed. Can you help me? Um, so checking in regularly can really help with that process. And then this is um, the preservationist in me. Document everything. <laughs> it is so important. Document your meeting notes. Um, have your emails, decisions, especially your decisions. If you have decided to put your copyright for images at the end of the chapter, make sure that's clear so that, that way you're not suddenly getting a list to go at the end of the book. Um, what are your workflows looking like? Um, especially if you're gonna do a second volume of this book, maybe you can then just reuse those same exact workflows and it's not gonna be as stressful. <laughs> no reason to reinvent the wheel twice. And then make sure you're putting all that documentation into one place where everybody can find it and refer back to it. Um, a couple of kind of fun stories about documentation. When I was at Cengage, we did, like I said, we put all our notes in JIRA and it was really key that all of that documentation was in JIRA and all I had to do when I left there for an actual full-time job, um, <laughs> I just assigned those tickets to somebody else and they had everything. They had all of my correspondence with content developers, all of my correspondence with the vendors who were doing the XML markup. They had absolutely everything right there. 
and that's important that that exists because staffing changes do happen. People do leave positions. I know we don't want people to leave, but it happens. Um, so making sure that all of their work is clear and documented so you're not having to go back and go, oh no, what, what was that person working on is really helpful. And then kind of similarly in terms of the decision-making process, um, I was involved with a DH project last year, a digital humanities project, sorry, I can't use acronyms here, um, <laughs> where we had had meetings and we had discussed um, what metadata standards we were going to be using and it was all set and we had it figured out and then as we were drafting the grant proposal the researcher said no we're not going to use that I wanted to use this and I said nobody in the library is an expert in that field <laughs> I thought we had discussed this thing and it, if that had just been kind of clearly outlined and documented it would have been really easy to be like okay no on this day we had this and we decided that we're going to use this standard and this is how it's going to go. Um, it makes it just so much easier to navigate those tricky situations and to kind of have that back and forth with anybody. And I think as I bring up a digital humanities example, it's really important to, to realize that some of the, these things that we're talking about and working with authors, you might have experience doing this, maybe working with researchers on a different type of research project or doing even a reference interview, figuring out what the needs are. So making sure you're, this isn't a whole new thing, you're not reinventing the wheel here. So making sure you're pulling those skills that you've built elsewhere into this specific OER world. And then I have a slide in here about working with other parties because inevitably you will work with other parties. Um, at Cengage, I worked with vendors to convert the files into XML. At Virginia Tech, we work with Scribe um, on a couple of projects. We also do all of our journal productions through Ubiquity, so we're working with them regularly. Um, one of our, we have a biosystems book right now that we're working with the society on then that's going to be co-published with them. So there's also things to consider in how you're working with your vendors as well as your authors and how all that is going together. Um, make sure you have shared goals that everybody is on the same page, um, everybody's aware of maybe what the schedule is or what the goal publication date is, that this is gonna be openly licensed, um, all of those things. Kind of check in on different areas of expertise. So this biosystems book that we're working with on a society, the society with, um, they have a copy editor on staff. The copy editor is able to do all of that for us and they're an expert in that field. Again, I wish I were an expert in biosystems engineering, but I'm not. So having somebody there that <laughs> understands the field and what they're reading and what they're looking at is really fantastic. So I can really focus on the production work. Um, and that's, I think that's kind of a key thing is looking for those other pockets of expertise that you can kind of leverage to help make this easier. Um, and then clearly identifying those roles and responsibilities. This is in bold in here. I don't know if it's really that easy to tell, but it's really important uh, figuring out if you're working with a vendor, what is what is their job? Um, what is what's the goal of working with them? What's the responsibility there? Same thing with societies. Same thing with anybody else. Just having that clear, again, expectation <laughs> in terms of who's working on what, and also creating an agreement or MOU that outlines those roles and responsibilities with your vendors as well as with your authors. MOUs are fantastic. Just have their, it's better to have one than to not have one. So make sure you're using it as much as possible. And then set, set schedules and check in regularly with these third parties as well. Maybe that's in combination with your author, you're all meeting at once and checking in all at once. Maybe it's separate, it's kind of up to you to decide, but decide that early on and stick with that, that system. And ask questions. Asking questions is always helpful. You don't know what they, what expertise they have and if you don't ask, you don't know. If they have a copy editor on staff, if you don't ask, um, just make sure you're asking questions wherever possible. And then I've mentioned a schedule several times. The actual process of making a schedule, I'd always say give yourself extra time and don't be upset when you don't follow your schedule. It's normal. <laughs> um, it's, it's completely fine. There are a lot of moving pieces in these projects. So 
making sure you're giving a little bit of bumper room to get those moving pieces together in case somebody is out sick and or Christmas is coming or something's happening. <laughs> Final exams are here and suddenly the author has a million papers to grade. That stuff happens. Um, so making sure that there's a little bit of buffer time in there. And then if, if that buffer time still isn't enough that and something falls apart, that's okay. Um, and then check in regularly with everyone involved. If something is falling apart, you need to know about it. If the author isn't able to finish their writing process because uh, they're too busy grading papers, it's better to know about it than to not know about it. Sometimes people don't wanna tell you that outright. So checking in regularly, and making sure that, hey, that's okay, we'll just adjust the schedule where needed. And then here's the checklist that uh, Karen mentioned earlier. This is really great when you're working on, especially just one project at a time. I'm not gonna lie, we have multiple projects and we still use these checklists for everything. We haven't figured out a project management system yet. So these checklists are fantastic for this. Um, make sure it includes everything, everything that you might be doing um, from really large items like layout and design to small things like assigning an ISBN or a DOI. Um, making sure that it exists in a shared space. Uh, we use Google Drive here. Um, if you have like a shared drive on a, net, like a network drive, I think that's the correct term. You can use that if you have a project management tool that you can share files on, that's a good place for it. But making sure everybody has access to it and everybody knows where it's at so they can check in on things. Um, identify who's gonna work on each item. If you look at that spreadsheet, there is a column in there that says assigned to. What we typically do when we're looking at that is we'll just throw in whoever is assigned to it, either their initials or their first name. I think it's different for every project we work on, so lack of consistency there. <laughs> um, but it's just a way to know, okay, Corinne's gonna be communicating with the vendor on this particular issue. Um, so and so is gonna be assigning the ISBN, and that way you know who's doing it, they know who's doing it, and that's clearly outlined in that spreadsheet, checklist, whatever. It could be a checklist in Microsoft Word, I guess, too. It doesn't have to be in Excel. Um, and then that's also a good place to note anything special. If you do have tables, making sure that those are being reviewed, assigning that in there as well, um, noting any extra math or figures. And then I believe Karen's sharing the spreadsheet. Okay, great. So you guys should be able to see it and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have about it as well. And then what to do when things go wrong and what could go wrong, because I'm going to tell you right now things will go wrong. I wish it wouldn't, but it happens. <laughs> um, so communication could completely stop with your author or with your other vendors. Who knows what's going to happen. When I was at Cengage, I think somebody, one of our vendors were in India, they had a hurricane completely lost power for like a week, set everything off. It was terrifying and we didn't, we really weren't sure. It was a huge natural disaster and we weren't sure what was going wrong. And we weren't sure exactly where their offices were located, how much they were affected by this, if everybody was okay, it was kind of scary. Um, and then in similar here, I mean, like I said, communication can stop when an author is creating a bunch of papers. They might just say, oh no, I'm too busy with this. I gotta focus on this right now. Um, and then the schedule can change. That could be for various reasons, but it happens all the time. Something might be missed. You might be chugging along and then suddenly realize that you're at the final stages and you're just about ready to publish and you forgot to check all the tables for accessibility because I have done that before. Um, <laughs> And you realize, okay, is it better to just get this out there or should we go back and do this? What, what do we do? So that's completely normal too. There might be a misunderstanding. You might've said, hey, I thought you were hiring a student to create alt text. Um, or was it supposed to be on me? You, might, you wanna make sure that those things happen even with as much documentation as possible. It's still likely to happen. And then staffing changes it happens all the time um, or positions change or any things things happen. I mean, uh, one of the people that we work with in accessibility services to create a lot of alt tags, she's a graduate student and she got a TA position, so she's no longer available to do that. So <laughs> we suddenly had to find somebody new. And I mean, it's good for her. She's got a great position out of the out now and then know she's happy with that. But it's, it's something that, that we do need to think about. 
and what to do. Just reach out to people, have honest conversations. I can't express how important transparency is. Um, if there is a big catastrophe happening, just keep reaching out multiple times if you need to. Um, that's what you got to do sometimes. Evaluate your schedule and edit it and your checklist as well. Um, it's okay to change that. It doesn't have to be perfect, um, especially if there isn't, if you have that buffer time in there, sometimes you can move things around and check that. Refer back to your MOU, your state of goals, your documentation, and that's, that's why you're doing it. You're creating all this stuff so that you all have a clear understanding of what your goals are and how you're gonna go about doing all this work. And then if absolutely necessary, is there something that you can add later? If you really have to get this book published by January 15th when classes start, um, that's an arbitrary deadline. I'm not sure if that's really when classes start. But if you really have to get that done, is there something else that you can work on post-publication? Um, maybe you can go back and create an accessible version after that. That's not ideal. It's really, truly not. But sometimes you just have to get that first version of the PDF out there and then you can go back, tag the second version in a couple weeks and then get that read out there as well. And then you can anticipate all the problems you want. Um, but there's always communication strategies that will help. Um, so thinking about early on what issues might come up um, that you could address while you're creating that CFP or MOU that you can address as time goes on. Maybe something comes up early on that you can then adjust to and then you're prepared to. So kind of adjusting on the fly and thinking about issues. Ask your colleagues at other institutions. A lot of people have done this stuff before, so there's no reason to stress out and reinvent the wheel. If there's really an issue you're not sure about, the OTN is a great resource to just shoot off an email, ask a question. Um, if anybody's involved in the Library Publishing Coalition, that's also another great resource. There's tons of people who are doing this work as well. It's, it's great to ask questions. Um, and sometimes they can point out other things that you should think about. Maybe another issue that might result out of the question that you're asking that you wanna that you wouldn't have thought of on your own. So really kind of leaning on those resources as much as possible. And then see this as an advantage. Maybe you can change your CFP or your MOU in the to for future projects to address these issues that you're seeing come up um, or potential issues that you might see come up. It's okay, not everybody has to have the same CFP and MLU. It can change project to project um, to kind of address projects or to address the issues that have come up in your first couple of projects. This is a learning process just as much for us as it is for authors. So feel free to think about it that way. And then this is really important. Make sure you're practicing self-care. <laughs> um, it's okay if something goes wrong, it's actually normal. You don't have to know everything. Feel free to ask for help, ask partners on your project, your, the vendors or the societies. Look for resources on your campus. Um, when I was first tagging um, an electromagnetics textbook here, I was running into all sorts of, or tagging it for accessibility, I was running into all sorts of issues that we had never seen before when working with projects in accessibility and because of all of the math equations that were in that textbook. I really, um, our accessible technologies department within our teaching and learning division had a accessible tech or accessibility hackathon. It was like a full day event. They had lots of snacks and they were basically helping anybody with any accessibility issues they had. I sat in that room with them all day for seven straight hours working on this textbook and learning from them. And it was so great and so wonderful. And I, I mean, I can't express enough how helpful they truly were. So a lot of campuses have resources like that. I'd suggest looking for them and trying to lean on those as much as possible. So there are people on your campus that know how to do these things and it's good to um, ask for help when you need it. And then again, asking your colleagues at other institutions. If you're running into equation issues and PDF accessibility, feel free to ask me. I've pretty much figured that out. I hope, I hope there's no other issues that could come up with that. <laughs> um, but thinking about those things and making sure, hey, so-and-so published a book very similar to this one. Maybe they've run into these issues as well and I can ask them for help. And then have an open conversation about your challenges or about any challenges to the MOU. 
it's very common, I think, for authors to not, I mean, how many people have fully read the agreements on their Apple iPhone? <laughs> so it's very common sometimes for, I think, authors to not fully realize what they agreed to or to forget. It happens all the time. Like, hey, I forgot that I said I was going to do this in the MOU and now I'm asking you to do it. And no, I really need you to do it. And we all have multiple projects going on. So making sure that you're having an open conversation about this is why we laid it out in the MOU to say this. Um, and this was the goal that we agreed on. So just, just be transparent and be honest about those things. I think that goes a long way. And then know when to say no. Um, I know there's, we had a project here where the authors had, had agreed on not using open content or had agreed on using open content to adapt their um, book. And they just insisted, no, I'm, no, I'm not going to do that. I want to change the licensing to be this. That's not what they had agreed upon. So we finally just backed out and said, nope, that's, that's not our project. Then this is not the work that we're doing. I'm sorry. That's not what we do here. So feel free to, if they're really pushing too much on changing some of the stuff that you're working on, it's okay to say no. It's okay to say no. This is not what we agreed to do. Um, especially those of us with library backgrounds can kind of have a hard time saying no sometimes. So it's it's good to remember that it's okay. <laughs> oh, and then any questions, I guess, or reflections. Thank you, Corinne. It's great to hear all of your um, stories from the field and what you've taken from them and and um, you know, sharing, I think, sort of themes to let people know that they're not alone when things might go a little off the rails. So um, you talked about how difficult it can be to make tables accessible, and Ellie shared a link in the chat for accessibility in tables, and I thank you for that. And then um, she and Larry are chatting a bit. You mentioned, uh, Corinne, in your talk that you know maybe you have to release a textbook before you have it made it accessible because of you know t deadlines or something went wrong and so i think larry was wondering you know is that something you can do and what's involved in going back afterwards um, mm -hmm. to try to make things accessible uh, do you want to comment any further on that yeah so what we ended up doing it was an engineering textbook where i tried to tag the document and it made all the equations look funny it added like weird parentheses for the equations which i didn't even know was possible with adobe i'm still not sure what caused that um, but the professor really needed it to teach his class, so we released a PDF through our institutional repository and got the print-on-demand version ready, and then as soon as I had that accessible version, we just also added that to the same record in our institutional repository, and instead of calling it like an accessible version, I think we said like machine reader friendly. Um, there are a lot of things about like calling things accessible versions, so we I, I forget exactly how we termed it, but Sometimes it's okay to release it afterwards if, if it's really needed, I think. And it's not ideal. I'll, I'll say that a million times over. It's mm -hmm. really not ideal, but mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Corinne. Are there other questions for Corinne or things that you thought of while listening to her stories and her top tips that you would like to clarify? Or if you did um, go to the checklist at the link in the chat, if you might have questions about what's in the checklist, for example, um, in terms of DOIs, perhaps, or ISBNs. Um, Larry has another question related to accessibility and asking if it's more difficult to create tags later, if it takes more time to kind of do it retroactively. I think it depends on the workflow you're following. Um, this specific book, we did all of the tags. Um, it was a LaTeX book. So the book was created, written in LaTeX, and then it generated a PDF. So we just had to tag the PDF. Um, I think if you're doing something like in press books, it would be harder to go back and do accessibility later than it would be to just do it while you're working in the process. So just, I think, examining the workflow that you're following and then figuring out how does accessibility fit in there right away. I personally prefer workflows that um, accessibility can be kind of carried through throughout the process. I think that's a lot easier, um, but things are different for different processes. So, <laughs> And um, Elle describes, she says that she likes to um, sit down at the start of the project with an author and look at the communication or collaboration or project management tool, whatever you want to call it. 
um, and use that opportunity to kind of look at the tool together, discuss roles. Um, have you ever you know, introduced a faculty member to a particular project management tool that you'll be using or how have you, how have you decided on a tool with an author in the past? Um, I don't know if any of our specifically OER authors are actually following any of the tools that we use. Um, we typically communicate them strictly through, with, strictly through email. In terms of some other projects I've been on, I've kind of let the author pick the tool. Um, like I said, I already have accounts on like five different tools anyways. So whatever works best for them and they're the most comfortable with, I'm willing to work out. Um, I think it kind of, a lot of the times we end up just using like a spreadsheet, <laughs> which isn't ideal, but it's again, it's whatever works best for them because I really, I've been in so many situations where you agree on a tool and then nobody actually uses it and it gets kind of lost in translation. So I like to make sure that we're fitting something that already is going to fit into their day-to-day -day work. And it sounds like there may be a tool that you use internally on your team in the library and then at least you have sort of that record for staff changes or for whatever, mm -hmm. but that you're communicating primarily through email or a spreadsheet with the author. Yeah. Uh, Mandy has a question. Corinne, you mentioned assigning project tasks to people. Would those people mostly be the faculty member and a librarian, or are there other people who are on your team? What other roles do you work Yeah, for? I probably should have mentioned this early on. So Virginia Tech Publishing is a publishing unit within our library. Uh, here at Virginia Tech. Um, so we have Anita Walls, I'm sure many of you know her. She is our OER librarian. She's actually in our scholarly communications department, but she works very closely with our, our publishing team. And then myself, um, we have a digital publishing specialist, Robert Browder. He's fantastic. Uh, our director, Peter Potter. Um, Sarah Meath, who's here on this call. She's um, <laughs> doing a lot with uh, publishing. She's just got a nice publishing specialist position as well. And then we have five or six students um, that also work on things. So making sure that we know who's doing the DOIs, who's doing the layout design, who's doing print on demand. Uh, we have several people. Sometimes we just kind of direct it to those people. Um, so in our case, it's more than just us and the author. I, I know that in a lot of cases, it is just one person and the author. Um, it's just a matter of doing those things. I will also say that since we are within a library, sometimes we'll leverage other resources in the library. Um, we've worked with our, like our data services team quite a bit. They've been really helpful and sometimes we'll ask for that. So if you're working within a library, sometimes you'll have other folks who have expertise that can be helpful as well. So you have, you know, a pretty uh, large team that you can leverage and work with, including students. For somebody who is on a smaller team, perhaps let's just say, Corinne, it's you and an author, what would you prioritize um, in terms of your sort of publishing role to get a textbook out the door and what would you maybe leave on the table? Pick an easy workflow. <laughs> I think that's the number one thing. It's really easy to say, I'm going to let the author write however they want, but if it's not a workflow that you understand, it's going to make it more complicated. So sometimes doing more of a DIY workflow like Pressbooks would be a lot easier where you're actually letting the author go into Pressbooks themselves and add content directly there. That would give you less work to do on the production side of adding content, organizing it there. Um, if it's just one person, maybe you don't prioritize something like print on demand um, that can be a little bit trickier. So that way you do have just that online version that you're dealing with. Even Pressbooks, we do have one book in Pressbooks and it looks great in the print version, but it, the layout could use some work. So um, making sure that you're not super stressed out about what the layout looks like. Does it have to look exactly like this commercial textbook? Um, I think sometimes simplicity is key in making your work easier. Um, the more simple something is either the design or the workflow or anything, it's, it's easier. It's really easy to get caught up in thinking like, oh, this has to look professional and perfect. Um, but I think sometimes simplicity can make something look very professional and it also does make your job a lot easier. So I'd recommend that a lot. Thanks, Corinne. Rain, Rain uh, posted a similar question in the chat. Um, and so I'm just going to read it in case it, 
uh, inspires any additional thoughts, but she said, if you have a small team, do you have suggestions for avoiding burnout or overextending people? I'm still figuring this out. <laughs> um, it is a thing that happens. I, I think, you know, I think one thing I've noticed, especially with work with OER and digital humanities, a lot of the time the people, the authors, the researchers doing this work are doing it out of their own like passion. Um, they don't want their students to spend a lot of money or they really want this work to be openly available to be built on. And sometimes that can, I, th I think there's a little bit more extra emotions in that, which are really fantastic because it's so great to work with people who are so passionate about the work that they're doing. I really love that um, that part of it where they're not just like, I just want to get this out. Um, but sometimes it does mean that you're dealing with this another thing. I'm, I'm going to use the term, I guess, emotional labor. Um, so I think setting your boundaries is very important. Um, and I say that in a in a way that I'm still working on figuring out how to set my boundaries, um, but making sure that you know this person likes to email me at nine o'clock at night and I'm not comfortable with, and they expect an immediate response and I'm not comfortable with that. So making sure it's clear, like, no, you're not gonna get in a response to a nine o'clock at night email. And I think that's where just being transparent in your communication is really important. Um, I don't know how much that really helps with burnout, but I think it helps with kind of the work-life balance a little bit. Um, and then sometimes I think it's really important just to be okay with the schedule not going as planned. I think sometimes things take longer than we're anticipating, especially if it is just like a one-person shop, and that's okay, um, but making sure that you're not putting too much pressure on yourself to get this book finished by a certain date. and having that clear communication with the author I think is really key. I don't I know it's, it's not super great in answering the question, but I think just making sure you have that balance is really important. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's a process and a negotiation with ourselves and with other people and I would definitely say don't give out your cell phone number. <laughs> yes. Oh my gosh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> not 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 advised. Um also making sure that like if you're the type of person that needs to have um like your space like i have a cubicle not a full office and i have one researcher that has been known to just show up at my cubicle and i've been on like webinar calls before and i'm like oh oh hey hey how's it going like <laughs> this is not a good time so maybe making sure that <laughs> you have a clear um clear boundaries in terms of like we will have set check-in times and this is when i'm available to meet and sometimes even just being a little bit more upfront like this is the other work that i'm doing so they realize that this isn't just your like their project isn't your full-time job um and that doesn't have to be said in like a i have so many other things to do way but kind of like a i, I really i do care about your work and i do appreciate the work that you're putting in but i do have other projects that i'm working on as well right and I find this might be a little nerdy, but I find sometimes to help with burnout is that that process you mentioned, Corinne, of stepping back and saying, like, what did we learn this time around that we can do differently next time? It helps me feel like I get off the hamster wheel or I'm just sort of pausing, taking a breath, reflecting, and then sort of gathering my strength again <laughs> before going out there to, to work on another project. So I think that particular process, which can easily be missed um, because you have deadlines, you need to get out your call for proposals, it's kind of this sometimes go, go, go um, tempo. But if you are able to carve out that reflection time, it can, it can help. Absolutely. So we have uh, but a few minutes remaining. Are there other questions you would like to ask Corinne in the chat or perhaps uh, you'd rather not type it out and you wanna turn on your microphone, you're invited to do so. So I won't give you my cell phone number, but you can have my email. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, I can throw that in the chat if anybody's interested in reaching out to me with questions afterwards as well. <laughs> Thanks, Corinne. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about our remaining two sessions and your homework. So um, your homework is to skim units four and five in the publishing curriculum. And Notice that it's not read or study, it really is skim, and the idea is just to kind of get an impression of what's there. 
to familiarize yourselves with editing and design concepts. A lot of this um, came from specific scribe documentation when we started our partnership. So some of it may be, um, you know, just kind of a, a, a bit out there or difficult to pin down. And I'm totally open to that feedback in the, in the unit feedback, but um, it's just meant to introduce you to editing and design concepts, which is traditionally a big part of publishing textbooks and that process. We will be joined by Elvis Ramirez from Scribe next week. He'll tell you more about Scribe, what it's like to work with them. And um, we have what I think is a fun assignment. And that is, I'd like to ask you all to look for one instructional book that you consider beautifully and helpfully designed. It could be something that you used. It could be hand-drawn. It could be mass-produced. Um, please be creative and feel free uh, with this assignment. And um, we'll have time to just share uh, a couple examples and ask you to talk about you know, why you like it, why it was so helpful in teaching you something new. And then we'll sort of use that as a jumping off point in discussing you know, structure in textbooks, recurring elements, styles, and the role that design has to play beyond making it pretty, uh, which is how a lot of us think of design. Um, there is also a function there. So that's what we have in store. If you have uh, any questions between now and Wednesday, please let me know. I will follow up with an email and get our video posted as soon as possible. And now please uh, join me in thanking Corinne for sharing her stories and expertise. And I look forward to seeing you all next week. Thank you, Corinne.